Good evening, everybody. Woo, I'm sorry. I got to remember not to look down. That is not good. Uh, I am glad that you are here. Glad you're a part of our class tonight. For those that are in the building, those out in the parking lot, I'm glad that you were able to be here with us. Those tuned in at home, uh, I, well, I'm glad that you can see us, but we sure miss seeing you, and hopefully that can that can change. Hopefully we can all be back together sometime real, real soon. We're going to hope for that and pray for that. So if you're watching at home, we certainly miss you and uh, glad that you're able to be with us uh, through this virtual option tonight. Luke chapter 4, if you'll get your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 4. We're going to step away from John here. We're, we're sort of pacing out uh, as close to chronologically as we can get when it comes to the story of Jesus, we've tried to pace out uh, things as they took place, sort of in order. So I hope that's been beneficial. It, ha it really has to me. It's kind of, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily changed my, um, my outlook on the story. I wouldn't say that. But I would say that it has helped me to kind of see how things happened as they happened. Uh, I, I'm, I've told you this many times. I'm a, I'm a visual learner. So things that I read, I, I have to sort of try to picture them. And it's been helpful to me to, to go through this sort of chronologically and think about Jesus in, in very, what I would call very normal human circumstances. Uh, you and I, we make a daily schedule probably. Some of us don't. Some of us just show up and fly by the seat of our pants and we get to the end of the day and we kind of wonder how we got there. Um, and, and we're kind of surprised at how much stuff we got done uh, that we didn't really plan on. Uh, but some people are very organized and very scripted uh, I, I don't know that Jesus was a scripted person. I, I don't get that feeling. I don't get that vibe from him. I get the vibe of a guy who got up every day and just lived life. And as he went, which is Matthew 28, as he went, he talked to people about salvation. It was just his conversation. It was his conversation piece. Um, I, I think we've made that into um, we've made that into a fanatical thing now where if you talk to someone about Jesus all the time, if that's what you talk about, we've sort of made that, we've painted that in our world as being somewhat fanatical, that you shouldn't be that way, you shouldn't be so over the top and constantly talking about it. And yet, the example that we have is Jesus basically just does that in every conversation. The ladybugs and wasps are back, by the way, if you didn't know. So I got attacked by one, uh, I think it was Sunday morning during class, I could feel him hit me right in the back of the head, so... Um, if you see me swatting, that's why. Um, but we've made that into a fanatical thing, and we, we've sort of ignored the example. I, I, I wouldn't say by our world's definition, I would not say that Jesus was what we kind of commonly refer to. I don't know if we use this phrase anymore, but the Bible thumper. You guys, you guys have heard that before, I'm sure. And that was sort of represented as a negative. It was somebody who was constantly, that's where that came from, constantly you know, pounding their Bible and shoving it in your face and the world painted that as a, as a negative. And they said, that's too much. It's over the top. It's outlandish. It was seen as an extremist. Uh, and so for you to do that, that's got to be, you must be kind of over the edge. I don't see Jesus necessarily being a Bible thumper in that sense. I see him being a conversationalist. He's able to find people where they are, talk to them about where they are, and then show them that's not where they want to be. That's what makes him the master teacher. He's able to take people and convince them. Now, righteously, okay, righteously, in a right way, not in some sort of gimmick or some sort of trick, but righteously, he's able to show them, hey, where you are, wouldn't you really want to be over here? Can't you see how much better life is over here? That's exactly what we looked at in a lesson, I believe it was a couple of Sundays ago now, in John chapter 4, our Sunday morning lesson. That was exactly what we looked at. It was John chapter 4. He sits down next to a woman whose life was an absolute train wreck. And he says, aren't you tired of all this? Aren't you tired of, of this? I mean, you're, you're coming to get water in the middle of the day to avoid conversation with other people, so aren't you tired of that? Aren't you tired of all the nasty looks you get from other women and other men in the city because you continually go after people that aren't your husband? Aren't you tired of all that? And then by the time you get to the end of that particular scenario or that particular scene, 
You've got the Bible telling you, John telling you, that, that people came to Jesus because of her. It's amazing to see what he does. And so I wanted to start there because I think it's important for you to understand chronologically speaking. I, I don't think we give enough credit to the fact that this was just Jesus' everyday life. I think we try to paint these little pictures and we try to act like these things sort of happened. They were independent subjects that just sort of happened. And it's almost like your favorite movie series. They make a movie, they wait three or four years, they make another one, and then they wait three or four years and make another one. And you're like, yes, that's all, it's all the same characters and it's all the same set up, but it's not the same story. Each one's individual. And that's, that's not the way you need to treat the story of Jesus. This was just everyday life. He woke up in the morning from wherever he was sleeping, and he just walked. And as people approached him, he talked to them. Now, you and I, some of us view that probably as the scariest thing you've ever thought about in your entire life. You're telling me, I walk into my job, somebody walks up to me and asks me how I'm doing, and I tell them, man, I'm doing great, and it's because of the Lord. And I'd love to talk to you about him. You tell me I need to do that? That's the example Jesus set. Now, I know exactly what most of you are thinking, not all of you, but most of you. You're like me, and I heard this when I was a teenager, and I heard this when I was a young adult, and I heard this when I was a, a dad and a husband, and I thought, that's the definition of extremism. That's the definition of being a fanatic. That's, a, that's the definition of being crazy. Well, no. <laughs> no, that's just following his example. We're scared of that. One of the reasons we're scared of that is because we are, whether we like to admit it or not, we are concerned about what other people say about us. I've rarely, I don't know that I've ever met someone who truly, I mean, all the way through their core doesn't care what anybody says about them. You can say that, but typically if you have to say that, then it's really false because you're having to say that to pump yourself up. The, real, the reality is, Deep down, you do, you are concerned about what people say about you. It's human nature. So we don't like the idea of somebody labeling us. So if I walk into my job place or I walk into my school or even I walk into my home and I say, man, we, we went to Bible class tonight. We talked about this from Luke 4. I just would like to share some thoughts that came up to me to somebody in your home or somebody in your job or somebody. We're like, man, they're going to label me a... a fanatic. They're going to label me an extremist. They're going to label me some Bible thumper. They're going to... Did they label Jesus? Yep. I mean, they labeled him a heretic. They labeled him demon-possessed. They labeled him being of Satan. They labeled him as crazy. Didn't really slow him down, did it? But we're worried about that. And one of the places we're worried about it most is the place where we should be worried about it the least. We worry about it the most in the most comfortable of situations. We're very worried about how people view us in our relationships, in our homes, even in our churches. Luke chapter 4, there's this scenario that, that creeps up that begins in verse 16. That's where we're going to pick up. Now, there's an additional sort of uh, just a brief snapshot found in Mark. Mark chapter 1 gives you the really the bare bones. We've talked about this before, that Mark is kind of the let's get down to business gospel. He's not really fooling around with a lot of details. He's just going to go right to whatever happened. Here's three or four sentences on it. Next thing. So Mark 1 kind of gives you a brief little picture of this, but Luke goes into detail. Because if you'll remember, several, several weeks ago, back when we started this, Luke wrote his letter to how many people? How many people did he write his gospel to? One person. One guy. And if you go back to Luke chapter 1 and you read the first four verses, you're going to find out why. It was because I want you to know why you believe what you believe. I want you to know that these things happened. I want you to have concrete proof. 
I want you to know. So Luke's going to go into a little more detail. And this specific story, I think, is interesting that Luke goes into so much detail. Because as I mentioned, you're not going to find it in Matthew and John. You barely get it in Mark. But in Luke, he spends a sizable amount of time on this little story. And it's when Jesus goes back home. So begin in verse 16. Luke chapter 4, begin in verse 16. He came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let's stop there just for a moment. We're not told how long Jesus has been away from Nazareth, but he's had to have been away for at least a little while. Uh, If you read verse 16, you find that it's it's not a, hey, he was there yesterday and he's back today. It it seems to indicate there's been a little bit of time between uh, when he was there and when he's back. And and that would go right into Luke's gospel. If you back up into Luke chapter 4, the first 11 verses or so, you find what story? What accounts found in Luke 4, 1 through about 11 or 12? Temptation of Jesus. So where is he when that happens? Right, for how long? How long? 40 days, right? So it would seem to indicate that he's been gone from home at least 40 days or so. Now, it could have been longer, but it seems to be that he's been gone a little while. Because then you read after that in Luke's gospel, just this really brief little snapshot about him beginning his, God, his uh, ministry. So apparently he's been doing some work. He's come out of the wilderness. He's come out of the temptation. He's gone into the gospel teaching mode. He's begun that ministry, and now he's come back home. So there's at least a little bit of time here where he's been away from home. I, I won't go around the room, but I want you to think about the longest you've been away from home. I want you to kind of think about that. Was it a mission trip for some people? Probably, maybe. Was it work-related? Maybe for some people. Vacation for some people? Visiting other family or something like that? Maybe. I mean, I don't know what it is for you, but for some people it's, you know, typically we're gone maybe a few weeks. Some of our military men and women, they're gone for far, far longer. They're gone for months, maybe years. But what is the feeling when you've been gone from home for a while? What does it feel like to pull in the driveway of your house after you've been gone, let's say, just for a week? How does that feel? Relief. Relief. Feels pretty good. You ever heard somebody say it feels like home? Now, they mean something different than the physical house, right? When you say it feels like home, it, you mean something different than just the, the brick and mortar or whatever. It, there's something about walking in your door at your house, laying down in your bed. Now, let me give you some information. For those of you that have had the virus, that have had to be quarantined or you've had to be separated from your family, How did it feel the first night you got back in your bed? I can tell you from personal experience, this right here is a lot to sleep on the floor. Especially when all of this has got to fit on a twin-size mattress in the floor. I don't know if you know this, but when you're a biggin' and you lay down on a mattress in the floor, with no box spring under it, you might as well be laying on the floor. 
because I went in between springs somehow. I performed acrobatics and woke up every morning with, I mean, I couldn't move one side of my body, depending on which side I laid down on. And I will tell you, I tried every trick in the book. I'm putting pillows and blankets up underneath and trying to sleep. And I'd sleep about two or three hours and wake up and have to get up. And you know, there's nothing worse when you, you're good and asleep and you wake up and have to get up. Because then when you lay back down, it's just not the same. That little rut you figured out and was so perfect is not there anymore. And now your shoulder hurts and you're waiting. And, you know, and I'm going to tell you all, for 10 days, sleeping on that twin mattress, sinking between them springs, waking up every morning, limping all over that upstairs room. That first night that I was back downstairs and in my bed, I, I mean, it was incredible. It was like sleeping on a cloud. There's something about coming home. There's something about returning home and being home and being in your comfort zone that just, it gives you a feeling that you just don't find really anywhere else. Now, here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus goes on record later in his life saying that he really has nowhere to put his head. The foxes have holes and the birds have their nests, but he has nowhere to put his head. Jesus never really settled down, if you want to call it that, and like built himself a house and lived in this house, and that was his address. But Nazareth was home. Nazareth was home. From the time he was old enough to remember, that was home. And when he comes back into Nazareth, I don't know how long he's been gone, but when he comes back into Nazareth, you know it had to feel good. It had to feel good. And he does what he always does. He goes into the synagogue, and at his age, being 30-plus at this point, he has the ability, he has the right as a 30-plus-year-old Jewish man to read in the synagogue to an audience. It's perfectly acceptable. It's encouraged. So he goes into the synagogue there in Nazareth and asks for the scroll. Now, it's interesting for you and I, if you want to make a little note, I think this is interesting. If you look at verse 17, Jesus is not looking just to read. This wasn't like, give me the scroll, let me just throw it open wherever my finger lands, I'm going to read this. Verse 17 tells you that he actively sought this specific passage. The attendant hands him the scroll. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. To find something, you have to look for it, right? You have to look for it. To find something, you have to be looking for it. So he actively seeks out this passage. It's from Isaiah chapter 61 in our Bibles. Obviously, they didn't have the chapter divisions and things of that nature. But Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. That's where you're going to read what Jesus read. It's not accidental that he read this. By the way, there is a sidebar here that I do want to bring up because I think this is interesting. Jesus' willingness to lead, even when he'd been other locations for a while. I love the fact Jesus comes home and doesn't sit on the, and for lack of a better term, he doesn't sit in the back of the room and just kind of let everybody else do their thing. Jesus walks in the synagogue and says, I want to, I want to read. I think that's really, I think that's just really interesting. I just find that interesting. His willingness to lead regardless of geographic location. He does that his entire ministry, does he not? Every place he goes, he's fine being the voice, he's fine being the face. Some of us are scared to death to lead in our homes. Here's a man, here's your Savior who's willing to lead anywhere he goes. There's power in that. But he chooses specifically, sorry, that was just a sidebar. I didn't want to make that point. He specifically chooses Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And you, and you look at what it says, and it tells some amazing things that they had heard perhaps growing up, but they really couldn't wrap their brain around. I mean, think about it. Good news to the poor. That seems so strange. Liberty to the captives. Now, that should have rung a bell with the Jewish people, right? Right? I mean, that should have rung a bell with them, right? That should have meant something. Because they didn't have to look back too far in their generations and in their history to go, yeah, we know what captivity looks like. We got that. 
We talked about Gideon this past Sunday. You think about they, you, you don't think they heard stories about the Midianites? You don't think they heard stories about like our, our young kids, our kindergarten through second grade over in the annex right now are talking about from Daniel chapter 2, the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. You don't think the, these Jews knew about the Babylonian captivity? Of course they did. These people knew their history. And for Jesus to read from Isaiah that this, this one was going to proclaim liberty to the captives, that would ring a bell with them. But it's the other one that I think probably would have grabbed their attention, and that is the sight to the blind. You see, the first two are sort of abstract. Good news to the poor. Well, that could mean a lot of different things, couldn't it? I mean, good news to the poor could literally mean that the coins you have in your pocket. That's good news to them. It could mean a loaf of bread and they haven't eaten in a couple of days. I mean, thinking about it from their point of view, that's, that's pretty abstract. That's pretty, I don't know. Liberty to the captives is, is somewhat abstract because truthfully at that moment, they're not captives to anyone really. I know the Romans are causing trouble, but they're not captives necessarily. So those first two are a little bit abstract, but the third one is as concrete as concrete gets. A blind person will receive their sight. That's going to happen. And guess what? It happens more than once. At whose hand? His. So when he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, if you run the list as a let's just call it a good, faithful Jew, you're cool with him bringing good news to the poor, you're cool with him bringing liberty to the captives. It's that third one that goes, wait a minute. You can't do that. You can't make a blind man see. That's not possible. And yet he's going to do it. And like I said, he's going to do it more than once. I also find an interesting phrasing in verse 21. The English Standard Version says, and he began to say to them. This was not the end of his comment. You begin to say something means that there's more to it than what you said. Now, undoubtedly, he's going to unload on them with both barrels. And he knew their hearts. He knew how they were going to take what he was saying. I'm not not arguing with that in any way, shape, or form. I just wonder, did he call an audible? He began to say to them, today the Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And then they interrupt him. They marvel at what he had. They marvel at his authority. They marvel at the way he, the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. And they said, verse 22, is not this Joseph's son? And in that moment, it seems like everything changes. Jesus' tone changes. His message doesn't really change, but the way he presents it changes. Because he truly unloads on them with both barrels. Which makes me think that there's something about that question that triggers his reading of the hearts in the room. Because what he says next is, doubtless you'll quote to me this proverb, position, heal yourself, what we've heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. There's something about that question that triggers this response. And it's got to be that he sees through their, whatever you want to call it, facade, their, maybe their words didn't sound right. The way that they were marveling at him, it just gave away their heart. And Jesus says, I I know you people. (laughs) I know you better than you know yourself. So let me tell you what I know you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You want me to put on a show for you. The things you did at Capernaum, do them here. Hey, you want me to do some things here that I've done elsewhere. And let me just tell you, I am fully aware of your thinking. 
I am fully aware of your perception. I'm fully aware of your heart. I tell you that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Then he gives them examples. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. Verse 26, and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Verse 27, and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. Do you think they got the message? Did they get the message? How do you know? What's their response? You're talking about people getting defensive. You're talking about people reacting in anger. Now, just a few minutes ago, didn't the Bible say they were marveling at the gracious words coming out of his mouth? Is that not what the Scripture reads? So how did we go from marveling at the gracious words coming out of his mouth to verse 28, they heard these things all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. How does that happen? How does that happen? <laughs> so is it possible that maybe he hit them right where they were needing to be struck? Maybe you're better than I am, but a lot of times if I get called out on something that I'm doing that I probably shouldn't be doing, my first response is not, thank you for that. I'm so glad you helped me see the error of my ways. I love you so much more now than I ever did before. Maybe you're better than I am. My response typically is to either, one, justify my actions. Well, you just don't know. I mean, the reason I did that was, well, I just, or I get defensive. You don't know me. Or I get judgmental. Well, at least I'm not. Well, you've got, is that not what you see right here? So that begs the question. Somewhere in between when Jesus walks in that synagogue and unrolls that scroll and reads from Isaiah, somewhere between there and them threatening to push him off a cliff and kill him, Jesus found something in these people that I don't even know if they knew was so far gone. And buddy, does he get after it. I mean, he comes at them. You and I read this sermon, if I guess if that's what you would call it, beginning in verse 23. It's a really short little speech, 23 to 27. It's really quick. We read that and we're like, yeah, okay, that's fine, whatever. But if you were in the audience that day, that has such an unbelievably dramatic effect to the, 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 to the room. I don't know that I've ever been in a service or in a Bible study where anything remotely close to this has happened. I don't think I can't think of one off the top of my head, which means it probably doesn't exist. I can't think of a time where someone said something that was so profound and so moving and so penetrating that the entire room responded. I don't know that I've ever experienced that. And that's a shame, honestly. Because the gospel should make us all respond. Oh, sure. Yeah. This is the classic, who do you think you are? Isn't this the carpenter's kid? How, oh, I, I want to ask you to raise your hand. I just want you to think about this. How many of you find it harder taking criticism from those you know and love than from strangers? 
I think it's a lot easier to take it from people I don't necessarily know or that I don't know well. It's, I take it a lot easier. It shouldn't be that way. I'm not telling you that's right. I'm just telling you that's me. In other jobs that I've had and, and growing up when I was a teenager and in college, some of the things that I did to make a little bit of money, I'd have those people that I didn't really know. I just worked for them. They would come in and say, hey, you need to do this. And I would think, oh, okay. But man, if somebody that I knew and that I cared about, somebody I, that I was familiar with came in and said, well, you need to do that better, I would think, who do you think you are telling me? And that's kind of what you got here. This scene gets really ugly. I mean, this is Jesus' hometown. It's not where he was born, but it is where he was raised. And this scene gets really ugly really quick. They go from the gracious words coming out of his mouth to dragging him out of the city. Verse 29 says, they rose up and drove him out of the town. I don't see that as them walking arm in arm with him out to the edge of town. I see that as them pushing him, crowding him, yelling, screaming, till he finally reaches the edge of a hill on which the town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. Do you see how quickly this escalated and how quickly it got out of control? Now you tell me, what did Jesus say that was so nasty? What did Jesus say that was so evil and wicked that it would elicit such response? Obviously, that's a trick question. Because nothing he said was nasty, nothing he said was evil, nothing he said was wicked. Everything he said was truth. And their response to truth was, eradicate it and get rid of it. That's scary. Isn't it? I can't be alone in that. That's scary, isn't it? The equivalent, and this is not really, it's not apples to apples, but it's, it's at least somewhat close would be if you guys marched up here this Sunday while Alex was preaching and you just you shoved him out this back door out here and you tried to hold him in front of traffic. Now, first of all, y'all have to catch him and y'all know that's hard. But I mean, think about that. All seriousness, think about how evil that is. That a group of people supposedly in a house of worship, hello, Hear Scripture read, and the Messiah, the one, the one you've been waiting on, says today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And when they say, wait a minute, isn't this Joseph's son? Jesus says, let me tell you what you need to hear. <laughs> your heart's wrong. Let me tell you why. Here's what's wrong. And their response was, we want to kill him. I just, I struggle with this visual image. But verse 30 is one of those things that when I get to heaven, if, if the Lord's got a DVD room where I can watch things that happen in the Bible and I can just see them, this is one I want to put on and push play. I would love to see this. They are all shoving him and screaming at him and forcing him out to the edge of town. They're fixing to throw him off the cliff. And the Bible simply says, Luke 4, verse 30, simply says, but passing through their midst, he went away. That's what I want to know. I would love to see that. How did he do it? There's two schools of thought. One is it was miraculous that he legitimately passed through their midst. Like he just went through them. That's one school of thought. Other school of thought is somehow he freezes them, as not in literal sense, but he stops all that pushing and shoving and he just literally walks through the crowd and goes. Either way, I would love to see that. That had to be incredible. I tend to lean towards the second. I tend to lean towards Jesus stood there. And you know how it is. Sometimes things can get chaotic. People start yelling. And all of a sudden, it's like one or two people kind of stop. 
And then it kind of notices that three or four people kind of stop, and then three or four more, and then four or five more. And then finally, it's like the chaos kind of starts dying down, and then everybody's just sort of standing there looking at each other. And then it's like all of a sudden Jesus has passed through him and he's gone. I liken it too when Jesus squats down and writes in the dirt. You remember that? When the woman's brought to him and, and she's committed adultery and they want to stone her. And they're yelling and shouting and they're asking him what he thinks and they've got the stones in their hand and Jesus literally just stops and reaches down and starts drawing in the dirt. Just I've always thought Jesus had a way with people. And even in this moment, when they're so angry at him, he's got a way with people. Now that leads you into this final thing that I want to bring up in this final part. Verses 31 to 37, I, I just I titled this a good, almost great question. Jesus leaves there, that really ugly scene, he leaves it behind, and he goes back to Capernaum. And Capernaum was kind of his home base, I guess you'd say. He, he was born in Bethlehem, he was raised in Nazareth, but Capernaum kind of becomes his kind of go-to place. That sort of region of Galilee becomes his landing point. He goes back there, and when he gets there, there's kind of a ruckus going on. He's teaching on the Sabbath, and there's this thing that's happening, and truthfully, apparently it had been going on for, for at least a little while. There was a man who had an unclean spirit, and a demon, and the demon is causing all manner of chaos and loud noises and ruckus. And finally, Jesus pauses in his teaching, and apparently either the, the demon-possessed man comes into the synagogue or Jesus was in a location where he makes eye contact with this man. And the demon speaks from inside the man and shouts, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's verse 34. There is a lot to unpack there. First of all, you know, based on the book of James, that the demons believe that Jesus is exactly who He says He is, and they tremble, they shudder, they're scared to death of Him. We get that, we take that as a challenge, because it's not enough for you and I just to believe, because the demons believe. I get that, I understand that, I read that from the book of James. Got it. That's not even really the focal point here. The focal point here that I picked up on, and I know you did too because you're better Bible students than I am. Did you notice the pronoun usage? Did you notice that? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy What's the next one? Us. What's the third one? I. Why do you think that happens? Is it just random, just a, a translation issue, a transliteration issue? We got it wrong and somehow there's something there that shouldn't be there or maybe it's not that big a deal, maybe it's just a brush over thing. Do you find that to be true about anything else in the Bible? Stuff there by accident, stuff there by coincidence. Do you find that to be true about anything else in the Bible? The answer, by the way, is no. So there's obviously something to us, us, I. What happens at the beginning of this chapter? Who does Jesus go nose to nose with in the wilderness at the beginning of this chapter? The devil himself. It's almost as though the demon realizes, number one, who he's talking to, and number two, who he's talking about. And who he's speaking for, thirdly. And it's like, I know who you are. The devil knows who you are. The, the prince of darkness, the, the, the one, the evil one, the one that Peter's going to describe as walking to and fro like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He knows who you are. And what were the things that he said before? 
What have you to do with us? Meaning that you've got control over us. Number two, have you come to destroy us? They know who he is and they are scared to death of him. And if the demons are scared of him, then guess who is too? Satan. I know who you are. The Holy One of God. How about that for a, for a, a witness? The demons and Satan... I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? We know that you've got control over us. Look at Jesus' response. Be silent and come out of Him. That's it. The reason why I think this is so fascinating is the controlled power of Jesus. Meekness, you know, does not imply weakness. Meekness is power under control. Jesus has that in spades. He doesn't have to perform some ritualistic, some ceremony. He simply looks at a man who is eat up with demons and says, be quiet and come out of him, and they do. I just want you to notice how much power your Savior has. This is the same Savior who's going to stand on the bow of the boat and tell a storm to be quiet. And it did. Brother Marshall Keeble used to say in John chapter 11 when Jesus called for Lazarus to, Lazarus to come forth that he had to use his name because otherwise the graveyards would have emptied. That's how much power this man, this Messiah has. And then here's the good, almost great question as we close. They were all amazed, verse 36. They said to one another, what is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. If only, if only, instead of asking what is this word, if they would have just said who. Who is this word? Go back to John 1. You remember what John 1 says about him? In the beginning was what? In the beginning was the Word. If they would have just thought, they would have just realized that the Word that they're so enamored with, the Word that they're so astonished by, the Word that they're marveling at, is not a physical, literal Word. It is the Word incarnate. It is the man in front of them. Don't get caught up in the fact that he cast out a demon, although that is amazing and his power is impeccable. His power is incredible. It is, I mean, it is indescribable, his power. But don't just get caught up in that. Realize who it is standing in front of you. And if only they would have realized the who and wouldn't have got so caught up in the what. It would have been a great question. Still a good question. But it was almost a great question. As we close, I just want to make one point. The Lord doesn't change. He's the same today. He's going to be the same tomorrow, the same forever. And the things that you read about Him, the things that we study together from His story, should encourage you to want to be one of His children. So tonight, if you're not a child of His, if you're not a baptized believer, the opportunity is yours. And you can be unlike these people, and you can realize who it is that's standing before you and has opened the door for you. If you are a Christian, but you find yourself having made a move away from what you know to be true and what you know to be right, you can change that tonight. We're going to sing a song here in just a second. If there's something we can help you with. You know that we want to. We welcome that opportunity. We welcome you with open arms, just as your Lord does. We ask you if there's something of public nature that we can help you with. Come now.